It's one thing to learn something, but when you live it, it gives you a different set of tools to work with and a different sense of pride and aloha for it. You know, today, lei making has become a commodity that has been put on a shelf to be sold. And it's all about ho'onani nani ke kino. It, it, it has turned into that. The kani of the rain just sang to me. Because, you know, come from Hilo, mm -hmm. we love rain. We can think of 30 things to do in the rain and only four <laughs> things to do in the sun. <laughs> Delina Mai Kako, welcome to Keep It Aloha, a podcast that keeps it aloha by not rolling your eyes and grunting every time your kumuhula tells you to bend your knees more. Lower, lower, my kai. I'm your host, Kamaka, and my knees are still sore from ora aiha as I did 15 years ago at school. We have a great episode for you today, but before we introduce our guests, I gotta ask you for a favor. Please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash kamakadias if you want to support us for as little as $3 a month. If supporting us with money is not for you, but you still love this podcast, please consider leaving us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It helps out so much with the algorithm and helps us get bigger opportunities in the future. I read every single review because I appreciate it so much. And to prove it, I want to share this review from Chanel Camello. This person says, no history, no self. So proud of the host and all that he does for his culture with this podcast. He is well versed in Hawaiian history and his guests that he brings on compliments him and his podcast so well. I use this podcast as another source for learning about Hawaiian culture and Olalo Hawaii. Mahalo nui loa for all you do. As a Filipina American with no Kanaka blood, it is a privilege and honor to learn culture. Mahalo Chanel Camelo for this awesome review. Okay, let's introduce our guests. Support for this podcast comes from Texco in Hawaii, which features 58 convenient locations across the state. Fueling up at Texaco is fast and easy when you use the Texaco mobile app to pay at the pump. The Texaco mobile app is a contactless way to pay for fuel so you can get in and out of the gas station quickly. Fuel your car and fuel yourself. Pick up your favorite local snacks and ice cold drinks at your neighborhood Texaco today. Texaco at Tecron. Driving performance. Our guest today is a Native Hawaiian award-winning musician from the Big Island of Hawaii. This vocalist, songwriter, record producer, hula dancer, and educator is most known for his original acoustic compositions in the Hawaiian language. In 1995, he co-founded Napala Palai, a legendary Hawaiian music group that has released numerous albums which have charted in the top five of the Billboard Top World album charts. Napala Palai also won many Nahoku Hanohano Awards, including Group of the Year. In 2011, he released his first solo album, which reached number two on the Top World Albums chart and won him five Nahoku Hanohano Awards, including Male Vocalist of the Year. In 2014, he voiced the lead character in the animated short film by Pixar called Lava. If this is not impressive enough and you don't lava him already, he also regularly teaches cultural workshops around the world and runs the Kuana School of Hawaiian Music and Culture, teaching 200 plus students in Tokyo, Fukuoka, and Osaka. I am so stoked to talk stories with him today. His name is Kuana Torres Kahele. Aloha, Kuana. Welcome to the podcast here at ID8 Studios. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm I'm honored that you're here. And I got to say, you might be one of the best dressed guests we've ever had. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're just listening to the audio, you got to pull over if you're driving. Go to the YouTube or Spotify visual feed. And he's just decked out in lays with the poo-poos, the shells from Ni'ihau. A beautiful lei po'o that matches his Aloha shirt. What, what brand is that? Uh, Manu, Manu, Manu Heli. Heli. Pro I'm, and he brought me a lay. And he brought me a lay. This is the first time that I, I've worn a lay on the podcast. And I feel like I'm supposed to be giving my guests a lay. <laughs> so now you're inspiring me to do that. <laughs> so mahalo. I mean, she, we're, we're starting this out on such a good foot. And I know it's going to be an amazing episode. Can't mahalo. wait to learn more about you. Mahalo. 
So let's get into everything because we have a lot to go over. I always like to start at the beginning. Where are you from? Where are you grad? And what was it like growing up? Um, I'm from the island of Hawaii. Uh, I was born in a plantation village called Pi'ihonua, and which is just above Hilo. And life was simple growing up in Hilo. Um, there was a time growing up in Hilo where literally we knew everybody. Uh, and even if you drew, drove into town, you know, if you saw someone, you could tell whose kid that was, even though you didn't know who, really who they were. And Hilo has grown so much now that, oh, we can not recognize everybody anymore. But um, I still miss home. I live here on Oahu now in Manoa Valley. And Manoa Valley is the closest I could get to Hilo in terms of weather and green and quietness. Uh, but I'm trying to make my way back home. Mm-hmm. What school did you go? Hilo High. Oh, Vikings. Where we, yeah, where we learned to fend for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I went to uh, Kikulo Navio Colonial Pool, but I played sports for Hilo High. So that's like my second high school. Yeah, so a I, lot of my friends for When I was in Hilo. high school, you know, the uh, Navahi, they, you only get a few, yeah, that come into the high school, mm-hmm. Hilo High. So I think in my year, they, we only had like three or four wow. from Navahi that was... Um, coming to Hilo High, but yeah. wonderful school. I well, used to do workshops over there. <laughs> so what was your childhood like? What what did you do when you were growing up? Were you always into music? Uh, music, yes. Uh, because both sides of my family uh, is musicians as far as I can remember. Um, both famous and just backyard kind mm-hmm. Um my mom and my dad's side. So I was literally surrounded by it. And life growing up in Pi'ihonua uh, or wherever my family would take me, because my dad's side is from Kohala. Mm-hmm. And then my mom's side is, uh, my mom's from Waipio Valley. And so whenever we get gatherings, it would be Pi'ihonua, Kohala, or down Kukui Haile. Mm -hmm. YPO. And so it was kind of surreal because, you know, back then, a lot of my ohana were uh, either pure Hawaiian, manaleo, you know, they speak uh, Mm -hmm. back then. And so to grow up listening to the different dialect from Kohala, Poe Kohala, and Poe YPO, and then we even get ohana in Ka'u and the Poe Ka'u how the Olelo was very, very interesting to me. And so all of those kind of stuff, and then the music, put that all together, was a recipe for me in terms of what I do today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you're really rooted and you have a lot of culture that you bring with you in your everyday life that shows through your music and pretty much everything you do. I mean, even now, like, look how cool you look. (laughs) <laughs> I'm so jealous. I, I can't get over it. I, mean, <laughs> I only dress. I only dress two ways. This is <laughs> this is number two, and number one is puka shirt, <laughs> alu alu it's, shorts. It's the bottom of the spectrum, top of the yeah, spectrum. The only two no ways. in between. No more in between. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you for for showing me up today on my own <laughs> podcast. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Mahalo. Yeah. So, um. You said that you had a lot of people in your life that were Manaleos that spoke the language. But um, how much of that did you actually obtain when you were growing up? Not that much. Um, I was raised by my grandmother. And so as a result, I I was, you know, everywhere that she went. And so that's that was my exposure to a lot of them. But I was eight, nine years old at the time. And... Though I never really pay attention to that kind of stuff back then, you know, back then our brains were more Mm sponge-like than it is today because we never have smart devices to dull our senses and whatnot back then. So when, you know, they talk once, you remember. And so I do remember a lot of it and I do remember the cunning of their leo 
and how I could tell them apart. So when my aunties and uncles would come and visit us up in Pihonua, I could tell which auntie uncles was there mm-hmm. because I could tell how they was talking to my grandmother folks outside. Like, oh, I used to tell my sister, Malia, to the folks from Kau came. How you know? <laughs> and it's in the way that they spoke, and this yeah, is the, in Hawaiian? Yeah. Okay. And they had, so they had that leo Hawaii, that old, old kind of sound. Yeah. Very distinctive. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, my, my Kohala branch family, the way they olelo, especially the kane, very, very loud, very, very uh, strong in their leo. Um, it's almost like they yelling. Mm. And that's how Poe Kohala, especially the men, uh, would speak. But the Poe Ka'u, when they talk, it's very, very flowy, not... Uh, no rush at all, but it's like no blips mm. in the sentence or the structure. It's just kahe, sure. just kahe. And it um and once in a while they would hold komuka s. They would put the s inside, and I, that's the only ones I knew that would use the s, uh, as opposed to t. Yeah, like the the poini how. Okay, so what's an example of that? The only thing I'm thinking of is sa, <laughs> which yeah. is not even Cha. yeah. <laughs> um, wow, I've never heard of the S. Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to I'm trying to think of how to use it in a sentence. So it's like how how the poet of Nihao would change the K's to T's. Yeah. So like Sahasai. Yeah. Like Kahakai. But not all the T's, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so interesting. I'm I'm gonna have a linguist next week on. Uh, Kiao Nismith. Oh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to ask. Give him, him my about aloha. This. No Kiao. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Somebody that I, I he's still I'm, to Kauai, yeah? I think so. Yeah. So he he's flying in uh, to to Oahu. So I'm I'm really excited to ask him all these questions. Yeah. The 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 Hawaiian I know is just what I learned in school and what my dad speaks to us to this day. Yeah. But all because I didn't grow up with Hawaiian language grandparents or whatever. Mm-hmm, my dad's mm-hmm. not even Hawaiian. Um, so that that side of like when I hear people talking about their family, their kupunas, who are mana leos speaking to them, it's just so interesting because I I don't have that in my life. So the only time I can really learn about it is through this and through you know speaking with yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's a fine line for people who do come from or lived in an era where. That was still in great abundance, yeah. Though all, all of these people in my family at the time were all kupuna. Mm. Um, they, I was lucky enough to be around that kind of stuff and, and grew up with that uh, around me. And I do remember everything, so much so that I could tell the difference between the kani of the leo and where they came from. And, you know, bits and pieces of that of those memories stick with me to the, to today where when I olelo, sometimes it's just a part of mixture of whatever. You never know which one I'm going to grab from. And, um, you know, this Nihau Shell stuff that I wear, actually, why did I say stuff? Uh, Nihau Shell Lei that I wear, uh, one of the reasons why I I am an advocate for Pupu Niihau and Ohana Niihau is because my Hanai mother is from Niihau, and so that's my connection to Niihau and why I always have all these lay and whatnot. And so then that's another faction of the Olelo, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you put them all together: the Poe Poe Kau, Poe Poe Waimea Kohala, Poe Hamakua, uh, Poe Niihau. You throw them all in one pot, what do you get? I don't know. Yeah. Whatever come out. You're you're just an amalgamation of culture of everything that you you've gained throughout your life. Pretty much. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh so they never actually taught you Hawaiian though. No. They so, just they just spoke it around you. Yeah. So how did you end up learning it? So I never did go school, but I've been around it enough to pick it up on my own. I never started uh, speaking from when I was young. It came, um, all of that came just after high school. Once I started getting deep in Hawaiian music and hula, 
And once my grandmother saw what direction I was going, then she started to culture that. And then I, in turn, asked a lot of questions. And that's where it started. And then from that point, all the way fast forward to today, I picked it up. And you know, the wonderful thing about being a Hawaiian musician is once you do start picking up the language and then you pay attention to poetry. And then my mom used to tell me, she said, you know, when you go on a stage, you got to look good. And that, that's where the whole lay thing comes in and dressing nice. And she said, make sure your mele, you know what your mele talk about, because how you can sing for them if you don't, if even you don't know mm -hmm. what the mele talk about. So pay attention to the olelo, the hua olelo. And then when you sing, then you can, you can share the emotion of Kela Mele. And so, you know, I started to pay attention to the poetry of songs. And then in doing so, I noticed uh, similarities of poetry from Haku Mele. And then I got used to those similarities. And whenever I would hear a structure for a pauku, for this Mele, I would recognize that. I was, oh, I already kind of know where it's going. Um, what it's talking about. And then that also helped me decipher Kauna. And then once you get a knack for that, that's like an added level to Olelo Hawaii. And so then now you have this poetic side mm -hmm. of Olelo Hawaii that you can only really use when you hakumele. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to use it in a conversation, people would look at you weird. Yeah. No, I think there's a lot of kauna to Hawaiian, like just like the hidden meaning and you know, there's layers. One thing could mean many things, yeah. right? There's a lot of symbols and ho'ailonas and signs and that's the beauty of our language, right? And one thing that my school taught me was not to just uh, do something or say something. Everything has, has to have meaning, right? Because in Hawaiian, where in the Hawaiian culture, everything's very intentional. So even when we would sing songs or do chants, for example, Kaulana Napua, one of the most famous songs, we, we, we would have to break down every single line mm -hmm. and then say, okay, this is what it means, but not the direct translation, but this is what they're saying. And um, while do, doing that, it really opens up your mind and helps you see the world in different ways. Kalehua Krug, when he came on, he talked about the the beauty of learning the language isn't just to learn the language, or the goal isn't just to learn the language, it's to expand. It's like the journey of learning, you know? And I, I feel like through, through that, you're able to just discover so many new things about you, about the world, and then kind of level up your life and even your your songwriting. So one of the songs I, I really want to talk about that's one of my favorite songs of yours of all time. Like I remember I remember my sister playing it on the ox chord a couple years ago while we were driving to, I don't know, Waikolo or something. Uh, and it was Navaqueros. No. And oh, it's such a beautiful song, but I was interested in it because I love listening to Hawaiian music. Um, it's a It's a great way when you're learning language uh, or trying to maintain language to, you know, continue just by listening to people sing. It's it's it's, it's not as boring as just like watching something. Um, so they played it and then you're singing in Hawaiian and then you start singing in Spanish. <laughs> I'm like, what? What is going on? I've never heard that in my life. I've never heard a mixture of Hawaiian and Spanish before. And I studied Spanish in college and I lived in Spain and Argentina. Um, so I was really into Spanish. So that's why it had like the Hawaiian language and Spanish language. So it was just the perfect song that spoke to me. And then the Mo'olelo, the story you told throughout that song, it was so beautiful. Well, I want to say first, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> well, uh, you spoke it well, you sang it well. Thank <laughs> you, thank you. You know, how I got the Spanish was uh, one of my cousins at the time, she was dating one Spanish boy, like from the motherland. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting him at a family gathering. And when I had the idea for the vaqueros, uh, he was the first person that popped in my mind. And so I went to him and he was the one who helped me with Spanish. 
And then I had to sit down with him so he could help me with the kani and how to make the, the tongue and mm-hmm. the mouth and all that kind of stuff. How to roll your R's. Yeah. <laughs> and once I finished Navaqueros, believe it or not, I sat on it for like eight or nine years. I never, I wrote it and I just put it away. And uh, one of my good friends who comes from another group, he lives in Kauai now, uh, Kupawa. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. His name is uh, Kellen Pike. He came over to my house one day and he sees my songbook. And so he's just kind of just looking through the pages and he sees this song, Navaqueros, that's half Hawaiian, half Spanish. He's like, so he tells me, hey, what is this song? I go, oh, I wrote that, blah, 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 blah. He's like, so sing it for me. And so I started to play it for him and he said, you got to record this song. I go, you think? It took some convincing because I was real uh, hesitant to record Navaqueros because of what it was. Mm -hmm. There was no other song that was hapa in the sense of, you know, besides hapa haole music, Mm -hmm. but hapa Spanish music, we do no more. And, you know, Hawaiian people, as much aloha as, as we have, were the first ones on the front to point finger the moment you do something different yes. or wrong. And so I was afraid in that sense for that song. And so I, that's, that's why I sat on it for a while. But he convinced me eventually. And it ended up on my album. And lo and behold, I was surprised. I was surprised um, how much people liked the song. And the, the Mo'olelo... Uh, why why I wrote about Nova, the Vaqueros. Actually, the inspiration to Navaqueros is my dad. So my dad comes from a long line of Paniolo. We don't descend from the Vaqueros, but uh, we do. Our Paniolo heritage in Kauai Hai goes all the way back to the conception of Paniolo in, on Hawaii Island. Mm-hmm. And so when the Vaqueros first came to Hawaii Island, one of the... Uh, Kanaka that was there that had learned directly from the Vaqueros. One of them is my great, great, great grandfather. Wow. And so since that time, all the way till today, all of our ohana, you know, we come from the very conception of Paniolo on the island of Fai'i. And so I wanted to write a mele for my dad, but, you know, like so much other dads, my dad's this tough guy, macho, macho, macho. Never really says, I love you, Kai, but you know he, he loves you. Um, but so when I tried to write, you know, Hawaiian poetry is so the opposite of that. And so when I tried to write stuff for me that my dad, I always hit the wall trying to write something poetically nice for him because I cannot come up with anything mm-hmm. poetically nice for him. And so finally I came up with this idea, oh, you know what, I'm going to write one song about his Paniolo heritage. And that's where the idea of Vaqueros came up, you know, the conception of Paniolo, why it happened, where they came from, yada, yada, yada. And so that's how Navaqueros came to be. Super cool. If, if anybody listening ha- hasn't listened to that song, you got to go. It's on Spotify. It's on YouTube. Go check it out. Pause this. You you have my permission to pause this episode, leave our podcast, listen to the song, and then come back. <laughs> Because we have, I have another question from one of the the social media questions about uh, kind of this topic. But oh. yeah, mahalo for sharing that. Uh, again, just mahalo for writing it as well. Because it's it's honestly one of my all time favorite songs, mahalo. all time in every genre. Thank whatever. you. Whatever. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about um, your career in music a little bit more, since we kind of already dove into it. You graduated from Hilo High, and then what did you do after that? Was the hula or the the music? W- which one came first? Simultaneous, kind of. Music came first because okay. that started when I was very, very young. Mm-hmm. Um, that started like when I was in second grade, mm. uh, and I my affinity for Hawaiian music started with ukulele, and then eventually it morphed into actually singing. Hawaiian music. And as I mentioned, um, both sides of my family have Hawaiian music. Uh, And so growing up around that, you know, you eventually learn by ear songs your family sing. 
And I remember, I think I was in the fourth or fifth grade, and we had a May Day coming up, and the school, school music teacher came into the class and she separated the boys and separated the girls and had taught us a song. And the boys was, were to sing one part, the girls were to sing one part. And when it came to the girls, she, she taught the part to the girls and they were too shy to sing. And so she, I remember the teacher saying to them, come on, is it, aren't any of you guys going to sing? Are you guys going to be shamed the whole time? And I remember holding the, the music sheet like this, and then I put it over my face, and really, really softly, I tried to sing the part to see if I could do it, and I could. And so when she asked the question to the girls, if anybody can um, doesn't want to sing the part, and I, stupid me, when raised my hand, and the whole class looked at me, and I was so hila hila. And she made me stand up, and I reluctantly sang it to them. She walked over to the, school, the classroom teacher. They huddled, they talked, talked, talked. And then they came back and they changed the whole thing. They said, okay, boys, girls, you guys all going to dance. Kuana, you're going to come sing. Wow. And so my, my whole class was pissed with me because now they have to dance. Um, and then the song that we ended up doing for Mayday was Kaulu Oh, Of course. And then that was the first time uh, I sang for the public. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time my, my family heard me really sing. And from that, the rest is history from that. That's when my grandmother knew I could sing. Wow. And and you always had that kind of falsetto. falsetto. Wow. From yeah, second so grade. From second grade. Because that's all that they play in my house. Yeah, yeah. My grandmother, it's all, all she played. Jano ke ave, jo ke ave. George ka in pao. She liked that kind of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that that makes sense with some of your songs. Like uh, when you formed Napala Palai, you had some songs which really just like showed off your, that range in your voice. Like Lepe Ula Ula, is that one Lepe Ula Ula. So beautiful. And that one, you go high. <laughs> Now I know can go like high and I'll go pass out. I know. You know Liam Moletta? <laughs> yeah. He he always does that. I love it when he sings that. You had him on here too? Uh, not here, but I see him all the time. That's my boy, that one. Yeah. He's like the the next you. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Following in your footsteps. So. Okay, so um, I, after you graduated, did you go to college or? I never went to college. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did quite the opposite. I pursued my passion for music. When I was in school, I was in Halau. I um, mean, at the moment, with Uncle Johnny Lamho. The legend. Yes, I miss him. Yeah, how's your knees from Ora Aiha Azen? Not too bad, <laughs> because for, for Kawukani Lehua, it's not so much Aiha as it is back bends crawling Ooh. on the ground and doing death-defying. Oh, so your, your back Ula. is broke. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> We left the Aiha stuff to, to Halau Kekuhi. <laughs> but um, after high school, I, I pursued my passion for music. So I met up with my cousin, who was uh, a noted singer uh, and artist at the time, Akoni. And I moved from Hilo to Kona because that's the next big thing, step up from Hilo in terms of music. And we can, you know, work the hotels, Waikaloa, all the way, the, the whole coast, all the way into Kona. And so I did that for a couple of years. And then with Akoni, we then started to go to Oahu and do performances. And then it started to pick up. And next thing you know, we moved to Oahu. And so the first group I had, uh, official group, uh, that was out singing and performing was uh, called Akoni and Apalapalai Patch. Uh, and there's a particular song on the album that we recorded with Akoni called Heu'i, that when I hear the generations today sing it, it kind of makes me smile because everybody does it the way we record it. They, they think that the way we recorded it back then is the traditional way, but it's not. So it always makes me la smile because when somebody else sings it the way we, sing, we, we recorded it, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> But um, after Akoni and the Palapalai patch, then uh, we went from that into Napalapalai. When we moved to Oahu, that's when we met up with Ke'ao. Because um, in Napalapalai, there's three members, uh, myself, 
Ke Hau Tamare, who is also from Hilo, and Ke Ao Kostu, who is from here in uh, Oahu, Papa Kolea. Mm. And so when we moved here to Oahu, that's when we met up with Ke Ao and eventually went from Akoni and the Palapalai patch to Na Palapalai. Nice. And what's the inspiration behind the name? Uh, Palapalai, one of the most widely f- favored, used uh, fern foliage in lei making in hula. You see it everywhere in lei. You see it everywhere in hula. It's the punahele. It's prized for its beauty. So that, that mana'o, we took that mana'o and we applied it to our music. We took on that name so that in hopes that we would garner the same mm. um, likes and wants and desires, but for our music. So that's why we chose Napa And it turned out pretty well. <laughs> I think so. Many, Sucks. many years and awards later. <laughs> Millions of streams and views and listens. Uh, that's super cool. So um, how did... How did you kind of tie in everything together with lay making, hula, singing? What was it? Was it just so natural that you didn't even have to think about it, or were you intentional with trying to incorporate every all of that? I wasn't trying to incorporate mm-hmm. any of this. To be honest with you, majority of what I do today, I never ever saw myself doing this twenty years ago. What did you think you'd be doing? Music all the way to all the way till I die, mm. but um, you know the hula thing, the the lay making thing, all the different factions of lay making, uh, all of that. I never did saw, see myself doing it on a professional level and going out and teaching it, uh, because you know when you do something naturally, something that uh, you've acquired from family, something that you've acquired, uh, that you feel is just like. Just a part of your everyday life. Second nature. Yeah. yeah. You never ever think, oh, I'm going to market this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so lay making for me, I, I was raised with that from my grandmother. Um, she's the one who taught me. And I never ever thought to myself, oh, I'm going to start teaching people. It just came like so much and other things in my life. And, you know, the wonderful thing about Mea Hawaii and it doesn't matter what faction, because there's so much factions of Mea Hawaii um, that one could start. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you go to, but the moment you embark on that journey, it leads to a door. Mea Hawaii has this thing where it, it entices you. You set out to learn something simple, so you so you tell yourself. And so it entices you in that way. You learn, you learn. It piques your interest. You learn some more. And then it eventually leads you to a door. You open that door. This door leads to two doors. You choose that door. That door leads to four doors. You choose another door. It, lo- it leads to ten doors. Before you know it, you end up someplace else that you never thought you would do or be. And Mea Hawaii just has that thing. It does that to people. I think I could say honestly, amongst my peers, all all my Hawaiian peers from Hawaiian music to college professors to linguists, uh, they probably started one place and ended up someplace else. And that's just what it does. It's been doing that. For Poi Hawaii for a long time. Mm-hmm. I I totally get that. I, I feel like that's how my life has been. Yeah, it's a whole kai. You never know where you're going to end up. Yeah, you go through one door and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that this place was this big and I can go through these other doors. Yeah. And then you keep going and going, traveling, learning, experiencing things. But Mea Hawaii things. keeps you. It keeps you in this hub though, this hub of Mea Hawaii. I feel like it's like the base camp. It's like you're on a journey, but you set up base camp and that's the foundation of Hawaiian. That's, you know, your upbringings, your culture, everything. And then you're able to explore, you know, learn about this place, see cool yeah. things, meet cool people, come back and you got your base. You got your your Hawaiian, your Mea Hawaii. And then you go, you come back. 
I feel like that's kind of my life where it's like so rooted in Hawaiian, but also with other cultures as well and places and people. For me, the older I get and the more, you can never not learn everything. And so the more I learn and the more things I see other people do or just something Hawaiian, it makes me so much, I get so much ha'aheo in everything that I do and everything that I see and everything that people share. And for me, it kind of makes me a little kaumaha because um, uh, for me, a lot of what I do, if not everything that I do, um, comes from ohana. And now that I'm getting older, the more I do it, the more I think about them. And the more I see it and the more I live it, um, it makes it brings me pride, but it makes me sad because I miss all that stuff. I grew up with that stuff. Mm. It's one thing to learn something, but when you live it, it gives you a different, different set of tools to work with and a different sense of pride and aloha for it. That's why I love what I do. Yeah. I, I can tell. I can definitely tell you love what you do and you're passionate about everything. And I, what I, what I want to know is about the significance of delays and all these, what do they call it, adornments? Mm. Because we, we understand delays as these gifts that you give to people uh, you, for graduation parties, when somebody gets off a plane and you go to Hawaii, got laid in Hawaii, yeah. you know, there's, you know, there, we, we see it as that. But, and even when people ask me, like, why did lays become a thing? Like, you can talk about the significance of each plant that makes a lay what it is. But I honestly still don't even know, like, how it became a thing and what, the significance of it is for our culture besides, I don't know, to celebrate or is it really just to make us look nicer? I'm sure there's a lot of layers to this, but if you could share what um, you know, there, that would be there awesome. is, oh, th this could take up the whole podcast. Oh, this come because there, there is, <laughs> we got time. <laughs> there is, um, there is a lot of layers to lay making. Uh, and there's a lot of styles, not mm -hmm. to be confused with variations. There's a lot of styles. And, you know, today, lay making has become a commodity that has been put on a shelf to be sold. And it's all about ho'onani nani ke kino. It, it, it has turned into that. Um, and you see that... Um, you, you can totally see that on social media, uh, a lot of uh, homemade businesses or bigger businesses who have made their business off of make, making lay. But if you take all that away and you rewind the tape and go back, go back as far as you can go back with lay making. You know, in, in lay making, there are, a total of eight styles. There's no more than that. Some people can argue and say seven. I beg to differ. There's eight. Um, it's easy because the first five start with the letter H. Hilo, Haku, Hi Pu'u Pu'u, Humu Humu, Hili. That's the first five. Total different styles. Mm -hmm. Then the last three is Kui, Vili, and that's where usually some people stop. The eighth is right here, Nihao. It's another style. It's called mm -hmm. Niki. Ni Niki. 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 Never which, is, which is a tying. Oh, it's like Naki. Yeah. Naki. Oh, it's just like a dialect. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And so it's the same. Um, th there's a particular way to tie these uh, to be able to make these lay. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, style is called Niki. And so for, for grand total of eight, and every style has variations. Every style, so for example, kui, the kui style, which is needle and thread, you, mm -hmm. like the lei you're wearing. You can kui a flower a dozen different ways, which will give you a total different outcome, yeah, in terms of the how the lei looks. That's variations. Um, a lot of the styles have 
an abundance of variations, which comes to us by way of lay masters over the mm-hmm. years. Um, over the years, this particular lay uh, maker had ingeniously figured out a way to approach certain flowers or or um, foliage that when you apply it to this particular uh, style, you're able to come out with this outcome. And so all this information comes to us over the years by way of lay, lay masters. And uh, the earlier years, if we go back, back even further, like back to the days of Ali'i, uh, we didn't have as much styles back then as we do today because some of our styles are post-Western contacts. So we needed um, some of the Western tools or the Western uh, materials to be able to fashion certain lays. Uh, but pre-Western contact, the styles like the the H's, the Haku, uh, the Humu, the Hipu'upu, all of these styles uh, were specific to not so much hula as it was to offering, as it was to fokahuna and uh, what they would do when they go to heiau. And so those styles lent it themselves to that. Then we, we fast forward to post-Western contact, all these styles that we've taken from from those days and we apply it to today and then we're now able to use different materials with this style and then that's what it has evolved to uh a lot of people you know talk about certain plants in lay the use of certain um in in lay don't use this don't use that what this represents what that represents uh, hala, for example, lay hala. In the old days, you know, a lay hala, it's it's in the name, yeah? We would use that for a whole level, mm-hmm. for a funeral, because it's in the name. Uh, la'i, the red la'i, uh, because that, that represents kapo ulakina. Um, and so that also lends itself to whole level. And so they would say, oh, you don't can use this because it represents this. I guess it depends where your mana falls in this day and age, yeah? Because we can still apply those to uh, making lay and giving it at a whole level. But today, we don't necessarily live in that time. We can aloha that, that va. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're going to live yourself accordingly to that va, I don't think you can make it in this day and age. And so today, um, I think it's fine uh, to be able to wear, a, you know, a red la'i or to wear uh, lehala. It's it's fine because um, it's not like you can put on lehala and you're going to die tomorrow. Hey, you don't know that. Yeah. Because <laughs> why did they say live your life to your fullest? <laughs> and if you're wearing a lehala, then... You're set to go. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. And you just you just gotta you gotta know the risk you're taking when you wear the lehala. Because ha- hala in Hawaii means to pass. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's I, I didn't know there were so many different styles and yeah. like, um even I didn't know about the, the hala and all of that. But it makes sense because it's in the name. But it's one of those things you just don't really think about unless you really look into the etymology of it. Um but for something like the um the haku. I want, mm-hmm. I want to talk about that because I think there's a real big common misconception about leipo'o and haku, mm-hmm. right? Can you can you kind of break down this right now? Because yeah. I, I really want I want to post this clip on social media and like hopefully educate everybody because everyone's like, oh, that's a nice haku. Yeah, so haku is a style, yeah? It's not to be confused with what I'm wearing on my head. Uh, I don't know how people got confused um, but it doesn't help when you have 
businesses advertising it as a haku as well. Uh, but haku is a, is a three braid. You take in, and traditionally we take lai. We, we take three strips of lai, put them together, and then we braid. And then as you're doing this three braid, you're binding in ingredients. So palapalai, lehu, or whatever you can bind in. And that is what you call haku. It, it's the, the, the act of plating and, and binding different ingredients into a lay. Mm-hmm. And when, haku literally means to create. And the moment, you know, if I, if I, even the haku style, haku and healy are two similar styles because they're both a braiding styles. They're both three braiding. So if I, for example, took lai, and if I just did a three braid at, with only lai, that would, that would be called healy. Mm-hmm. Because healy is specific to one ingredient. So if you take one single ingredient and you do the three braid, that's called healy. So, you know, so, uh, one of the popular lei po'o or lei that you see dancers, especially the ones that do the luau's for the hotels mm-hmm. that they use, they use the, the lei po'o with the la'i, the tips. Oh, yeah, yeah, up. yeah. Yeah? Like, kind of like the crowns. Yeah, yeah. It's like the... So the some crown. of them, they're already wrong by saying that it's called a haku. And then some um, will always, will say that's um, haku. Haku tea, I've heard that, or haku lai. Um, but technically, that's healy. Mm. Because there's only tea leaf. If you only do one ingredient, one single ingredient, it's called healy. The moment you put something else other than the braiding ingredient, that's haku. Mm. What do, would it be vili too because you're twisting it or that's no. just something else? No, vili is when you bind. Mm. Um, which is what this one is. Yeah. This is um, done in a really style. And so getting back to the haku misconception and versus le po'o, uh, yeah, it's, it's important to know that haku is a style. It's a three braid, taking different ingredients, binding them into the le as you braid, creating this le that then when you're finished, it, if you wear it on your shoulders, it's called a le a'i. If you wear it on your head, it's a lay po'o. But not for one moment is it called a haku. Because if, um, for example, your lay, it's done in a kui style. Mm. I wouldn't come up to you and say, oh, nice, your kui. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mahalo for sharing that. I hope you guys take note. And, you know, if if you're ever confused, is it a haku or po'o, you haku the lay. I mean, ha- it's a haku or lay. You, you haku the lay. Yeah. It's that, the, that's what the you gotta act think. of yeah. making. You make the lay. And then what you put on is the lay po'o. Yes. So haku i kalei. Make the lay. Yes. yes. Lay le po'o, yeah. lay a i ku pe e. <laughs> right there. I mean, I'm going to start seeing people doing that in public now after they watch this. And then I'm gonna know what they're doing. They're trying to figure I've, out. I, I did it before. So I, I um I did one interview before, and I, somebody asked me about that, and I saw people in public go, "Kuana." <laughs> you might get that after this, you know, especially after this clip goes viral. <laughs> they're gonna be they're gonna be waving you down. That's a good thing, though. Yes, yeah, good good things for sure. All right, so. We're going to take a quick chichi break and we're going to get into our social media fan questions. Okay. Because we got some good ones. All right. We'll be right back. All right. We're back from a quick chichi break. Mahalo to our drink sponsor, Shaka Tea, for always providing the best chichi out there. <laughs> Romaki Tea Shishi. All right. So let's get into the social media fan questions. And this one's about making lays, which we were just talking about. This one comes from Leo Lani. She's, she wants to know, favorite vaiho olu'u to make lay with? Oh, gosh. I don't have a particular favorite. Uh, but if I had to choose my ingredients when I make le, it's always very traditional ingredients. Lehua, liko, pukiave, that kind of stuff. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Always. And moko kiave, you know. Yes, got to represent. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the red lehua. <laughs> okay, this next one. Comes from Akoni underscore on underscore stage. This person wants to know, why is he so freaking awesome? And did Mele help with Olelo? 
Mele did, uh, like we were talking about earlier, Mele did help with Olelo. Um, as a matter of fact, it helps so much so that it raises your Olelo ability. It heightens your Olelo ability because then you find yourself using words or structures, sentence structures that don't ne- aren't necessarily used in conversational mm-hmm. um, Olelo Hawaii today. And so when you apply it in such a way, you know, you get the eye like, oh. How you knew that? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Daisy. <laughs> I could vouch for that too because uh, I I learned Spanish, Malagasy, and SV Klein. So I've written poetry and other things in all three of those languages, kind of like how you do with Navaqueros, mm-hmm. but like Hapa, Hapa Haole, Hapa Spanish, Hapa... Uh, Hawaiian, or actually Fu Hawaiian, Fu Malagasy, whatever. Oh, wow. And uh, when I'm listening, so even when learning, it's such a good way to learn because I would listen to these songs in Malagasy, but then I'd get interested and hear certain words that, and I would ask people, oh, what does that mean? Or what does it mean when they say it like this? And then I would Google, like I, I would go line by line trying to uh, discover the the meaning of the song, the meaning of these words, and then it helps you with your your speaking so much. It really, really and then does. like you said, it you you get to know these words or um, say certain phrases, and then people are like, mm, "Wow, yeah, <laughs> it's impressive." So yeah, but um, you didn't answer the other question. What was the other question? Why is he so freaking awesome? Oh. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> Just because <laughs> everything we're talking about in this podcast so far. Okay, next question comes from S. Sean 0000. One, two, three, four zeros. Yeah. Okay. This person wants to know best ways to strengthen your falsetto voice. Falsetto or just singing in general, it's a muscle, yeah? Your voice box is a muscle. So use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the more you use it, the more you strengthen strengthen that particular muscle to be able to do what you're trying to get your voice box to do. It's just the same thing as I liken it to going to the gym. Yeah, if you want a bigger chest, you got to do the correct <laughs> um, exercise to get a bigger chest. You know, and bigger biceps, you do certain exercises for bigger uh, biceps. The moment you slack off, then that muscle either stays stagnant or it decreases. Um, in science. So voice box is the same thing. You got to keep doing it. And so my falsetto, you know, if I, you know, I know all kind of Hawaiian songs. And if I could just pull something at random, let's say something that everybody knows, Ikona. Uh, I know how, in my brain how to sing Ikona. I know exactly what to do uh, when I sing it. Uh, but if I don't sing for like six, seven months, and then I suddenly, six, seven months later, I want to sing that song. I cannot sing. Even though I know what to do. Mm. Because the muscle's not conditioned. I never sing for six, seven, seven months. The voice won't let you do it. Because it's not conditioned anymore. So you got to keep singing. And so what I tell people is you don't have to pay for a class to do that. Go buy some Hawaiian music. And sit in your house or in your room or wherever. And just sing along with the album. Like note for note. Try copy. That's conditioning. Mm-hmm. What if you suck at singing? <laughs> then I recommend crochet. <laughs> maybe a motor skill. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Fishing. Basket weaving. <laughs> Let me yeah, there's something for everyone. <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't think I can sing. That's what, what I just, I, I honestly never really tried. But just like whenever I would sing, I, I, I guess I'm self-aware enough to know that I'm I not think, a singer. I think most, not all, most, uh, people that come from either emergent or chaos leave with an ability for music. I'm gonna tell you the exception. Except for the the homanas, the students that would lip sync and auto olies and the songs like me. <laughs> no comment. That's what I would do. That's why I never I never got good. Even when we would have like the the classes, I would just 
like that. <laughs> or sing very softly. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was just shame or I just wasn't interested in it. I think of maybe a little bit of both. Because I'm like, oh, I got to do this. People don't do this at regular schools. Well, you never you know? know today. In your mind, you know the songs. You could. Yeah, try. oh yeah. I hear all of them and I, I sing along in my mind. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like singing, like people say it's a must so you can get better. But I feel like there are some people who are naturally gifted, just God-given talent. And then you get better with that talent. And there's some people like for me, I don't sing. I don't think I'm a good singer. I could probably get professional training to sound all right enough where it's not making people's ears bleed. But I still don't think like anybody could become a, a good singer just out of the way. It's, that's true. Not anybody can become a singer. You got to have some kind of talent. And sometimes that talent is hidden. Mm -hmm. But you'll never know until you try um, on a realistic uh, level. Because sometimes you, what you quantify as trying isn't try really trying at all. True. Um, but singing is also, it, it, there's a mind game to singing too. Because a lot of people put themselves down mentally more than not. Mm -hmm. And the approach to music has to be the opposite. You got to tell yourself, even if you're not that good, or if you feel you're not that great, you got to tell yourself you're a rock star because you got to give yourself that kekalina to try. Because if you don't, not going to pan out. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. Um, it does go in the opposite direction too if you're someone like William Hung and you think you're a rock star and then you're singing she bang, she bang <laughs> thinking that you're good and then you just become the next viral video. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you, how, how, how can you figure out like your, your tone? Because I feel like that would help um, you, trying to sing certain songs. If you cannot tell your own, I mean… Uh, I feel like I'm a lore. I would be a lower tone. Like a like a like an alto, you mean? Like I don't know. Baritone? Maybe, yeah. Because uh, I feel like if I like talk or sing, it's coming from like. Wait, you, so vaqueros, you said you like that yeah. song. You sing along with it. Yeah, and you can sing, by myself. You, you can hit the notes. You think? Right. I don't know. I I feel like it depends where certain note I would have to. It comes from like different. Yeah, like you jump to your falsetto. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I can try to hit the notes, but I feel like my voice will crack. Um, You know, when you when your voice cracks, it doesn't necessarily mean you cannot hit that. Mm. All it means is your voice is not, used, not conditioned yeah. to do that. Because the moment your voice goes or ventures into an area where it's not ma'a, mm -hmm. it, it freaks out. So it doesn't know what to do. Do I sing mm. with my chest or do I jump to an... The different part of my voice. What do I do? So it freaks out. And then you get this high mm -hmm. or this break over there. And that's all that is. Okay. That's it. After the show power, I'm going to put you to the test. We'll see, <laughs> where, we'll see where his voice is. Oh, thank God. I'm happy you didn't say to do it on the show. <laughs> I don't, don't want to lose followers. <laughs> all right. So yeah, best way to strengthen your falsetto is just practice. And just sing yeah, just along. sing. Grab okay. some albums, sing along with them. Okay, sounds good. Next question comes from Kau Kau Corner. Is there a melody that is associated with a memory that makes it too emotional to sing? Plenty. I mm -hmm. know who that is, Kau Kau. Oh, really? <laughs> They're trying to get some some tea. <laughs> um, there's plenty melody for me. You know, earlier I mentioned that uh, the older you get, you start to get a little bit more reminiscent of bygone days, people that have come and gone in your life. Um, and literally, what I do today, had it not been before all those before me, I wouldn't be here. That's for sure. And there are a, a, a few dozen songs that maybe today I can sing them, and then tomorrow I'm like, Oh my God, I cannot sing this song mm -hmm. right now. Uh, Keanu Waimea, which is one of my famous songs that I wrote. You know, when I wrote that song, uh, I wrote it as a birthday present for my grandma, the one who, who raised me. 
And Napolpola's album, when it came, when we recorded that album, the timing in terms of when that album was going to be done, it would have been done two weeks before my grandma's birthday. So my plan was, I'm going to record this song, put it on the album, give my grandma the album. She'll listen to it and she'll say, oh, nice this song. Like, oh, mama, it's for you. I wrote the song for you. Mm-hmm. That was my birthday present for her. But she passed one month before the oh. song. And so since that time, for like the next two and a half years, I couldn't sing the song. Every time I tried, I would break down in tears. And so Kehau and Okeau had to sing it all those years. And they, they did a pretty damn good job of covering me, making it look like I was singing, but it was really them. But I couldn't sing it. I couldn't bring myself to sing it. Every time I tried, her picture comes right in my mind and then I lose it. Mm. And so to today... And lo and behold, well, you know, at the time, of course, it would become the popular song. So most of all, I have to sing it. <laughs> Everyone's also waiting for and that. So, yeah. Now, if fast forward today, I'm not as bad or nearly as bad as a crybaby as I was in those days. But I do, you know, usually when I sing, I'm very emotional in terms of using my emotions to sing songs. That's my, my gas um, for songs. And so that's why I'm able to sing songs the way I sing, because I use, I manifest my emotion and then I put it into the song. Keanu Waimea is one of the songs I cannot. I have to leave my mind blank because mm. the moment my mind lingers, I'll lose it in a song. You, you really have to compartmentalize at that yeah. point and just like, or just real, really be in the moment and not yeah. think about anything else, huh? So, there, you know, when I first moved up here, we used to, Napolopla uh, used to perform at this place called Rainbows, Rainbows Lounge. And we used to have all kinds of kupuna that used to come in and watch us. And uh, um, Auntie Malia Kreva and Auntie Edith McKenzie, two prominent figures in, in the Hawaiian circles. They do all kinds of stuff. But they used to come and I used to sing with, um, I used to go and visit them before and sing and they shared mele with me and manao and stuff like that. And so when I sing songs that either came from them or is, um, has a pelina to them, or oh, that too. I, I cry. Mm-hmm. So there's, um, it, it's definitely hard to sing certain songs on stage nowadays. Um, but Keanu Waimea is one of those songs. Yeah, for sure. It's one. Of, it's a beautiful song. Yeah, maybe we get to hear hear something a little later. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Try and decide. See how the voice is feeling. Okay, next question comes from my stepdad, Kaloa Robinson. We were just talking on the phone right before this, and he sent me some questions. He, he, we were talking about Navaqueros, mm. and then he, he wanted to know, after composing Navaqueros with the Hawaiian and Spanish languages in the song, have you explored doing the same with maybe Japanese, Portuguese, or other languages? He brought up Japanese because you spent a lot of time in Japan, so he's wondering maybe that would be the next option. Actually, I already beat you to your question. Oh. So I have experienced uh, writing other songs besides Hawaiian and Spanish. Uh, there's another album I, I recorded, and that album came right after the album with Vaqueros. And that album was called Just Kahele. And on that one, there's a Hawaiian and Italian mm. song. Same thing, half-half. And then just recently, just a year and a half ago, I did another out. Al- I did an album called Aukahi, where all the songs that I do on there, except for one, I only wrote one. The rest were all songs from Japan, and I took those songs. It's like oldies but goodies, and I Hawaiianized them, made them into um, Hawaiian songs, and then I kept elements of the Japanese. Oh, uh, language in there so it's Hawaiian Japanese okay well I gotta look it up yeah that one's and called Aukahi Aukahi okay well I'm, I'm gonna call him back right after this and let him know it's yeah. already available do you plan to do any more? Um, every time I do an album I tell myself I need a break <laughs> and then here comes another album <laughs> you can never escape it <laughs> alright well uh, this next question comes from Mrs. Lewis 808. Mrs. Lewis 808. 
This person wants to know any plant suggestions local slash available to the mainland for lay making. That is an interesting question. Any plant suggestions? Yeah. Like like kanu kind? Oh, I think for or yeah, or I don't know if there's certain flowers maybe that they can find that's available on the continent that they can use to uh, make lays. Yeah, there, I think there's a lot actually because you know the uh, great majority of the flowers that are found in Hawaii today is not in fact um, indigenous to Hawaii. Yeah, like Bougainvillea, Plumeria, all that was brought in. Mm-hmm. You can get Plumeria outside of. Uh, I guess it depends where you are in the states. Maybe but, not New York. <laughs> yeah, maybe not New York. You gotta go flower shop. Yeah. But um, yeah, there it really depends what you're looking for versus where you're you're located. You know, I travel the world doing workshops. I go all over the the continent, uh, U.S., East Coast, West Coast, and every one of the things I do is uh, lay making. And in the old days, I would bring from Hawaii to there. And then I changed my my way of thinking. I said, no, I should utilize what they have there mm. so that they can do it again. And so uh, there are certain uh, areas that I visit that I know what they have in that particular area because I have gone there enough to know what you can get from over there. But, um, you know, one thing I think people that live in the in the states or in the mainland, uh, when you make lay, you gotta ha- you have to develop your lay maker's eye. Be- and what I mean by that is, you know, when you when we drive in Hawaii, you know, the eye always watching like, oh, that would be pretty on lay. Oh, that would be. Nice. <laughs> We're always watching, and you know, when I drive in the mainland, you know, what you would consider to be rubbish or pala weeds. To me, I'm like, oh, that would be beautiful in LA. There's one um, particular kind of grass slash flower that grows all over the mainland and it's called Queens and Lace. And when it grows, it, it has this um, big bud first, this cluster, and then it opens into this baby's breath looking pua. That is like a beautiful to make lay. So food for thought. Mm-hmm. One man. Sh- Trash is another man's lay. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds good, but <laughs> we'll okay. use it. Cool. This last question comes from Hale Loke M. This person wants to know, what advice would you give to someone who's looking for someone to lava? Hmm. I don't know. I'm not good at giving lovers lover <laughs> advice. Don't listen to me. <laughs> my his best advice is don't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my best. So advice, say something and do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, whatever I say, do the opposite. <laughs> Take them out somewhere expensive to eat. No, don't do that. <laughs> Save your money. <laughs> Save your money. <laughs> <laughs> Buy them flowers. No. Save your money. Yeah. <laughs> make your own, actually. Yeah, make your own. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Or how's about you go ahead and learn the song and go sing this song to them? Mm. Lava. That is a good one. Yeah, it's, that's a good move if you can sing or play instruments. Okay, uh, real question, uh, real quick. Uh, how do you feel about the fake lays? Uh, yes, no, maybe, never, ever. I, I have a compromise. Mm-hmm. I particularly would never wear them myself. And I would, I would never let my halal wear them wear it as well, especially because I'm a lay maker. Um, but I do understand in a pinch, sometimes people don't have the luxury of either making it themselves. It can be costly if you're going to buy it every time. But I, I personally feel that if you're going to embark on the journey of hula, for example, then you should know what comes with that and you should prepare yourself for that so that you can wear the adornment every time. A lot of, a lot of time, um, times when halal perform, based off of whatever the song is talking about, they feel, oh, this song, Pakalana, I have to wear Pakalana, but it's not seasoned, so I will wear a fake Pakalana. Mm. You can do that, that's fine. But um, you don't, you're not limited to Pakalana, just wear, wear a lay. 
Mm. Wear something real. Yeah. As Go the like extra mile. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to. Um, a lot of my my friends and colleagues uh, in the hula world, especially the Miss Aloha Hulas, uh, one of my good friends is Mahela Nimika. And uh, when she, you know, she's a performer, aside from an educator and a teacher. Uh, when she goes out and performs, you know, she got to pack her costuming across several prefectures and states or wherever we're going. And, you know, in that uh, setting, we cannot necessarily travel with fresh adornments because they wouldn't last the journey. And so in that essence, we or they use fake flowers, fake for the hair, fake lace, for that kind of a production's worth of a trip. Um, but if you're a halal and you can compete or do a performance, try, mm -hmm. try and get fresh lay. But if, you know, for some reason cannot, really, really, really cannot, I think it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah only in uh, just the don't break, make it a break habit. glass scenarios. Yeah, just yeah. don't make it a habit. Okay, right on. Mahalo everybody for the social media fan questions. Make sure you leave some for our next guest and maybe your question will make it on the podcast. I want to talk about your time with, uh, uh, I want to say Anakala Johnny, but I don't even know him. So I feel like I can't even say that. But, um, you know, Kumu, Kumu, John, can I just say Johnny Lamo? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> That's fine. I want to say Anakala because Auntie Kaula yeah. is, is my uh, brother's wife's mother. So, his mother-in-law. Yeah, his mother-in-law. I, I don't know. I'm making everything so complicated. <laughs> uh, but I want to I wanna know about your time with him because he's such a legend in Hula. And my family has a connection to that halal with Auntie Kaula and Leha Ahel, my sister-in-law. And um, if people don't know, um, Auntie Kaula Kamahele, she was... Um, uh, God, I keep wanting to say uncle. Uh, That's fine. Johnny Lam Johnny Lumho's first Miss Alohula. She had a beautiful performance in a peacock dress. You can yeah, look it up on YouTube. Oh, it's just amazing. And she still dances to this day. And every time it's such a pleasure and treat for us to see Auntie Kaula dance at like birthday parties and yeah, she's like she's like uh she, like a vampire. She looks exactly <laughs> the same. Yeah, she doesn't age. Looks... You you might see her on Hawaiian Airlines if you go. She's like Belina Maikako. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. her. <laughs> that's what that that's why I do my my intro in for this podcast. Oh, I go Belina Maikako because I think about the Hawaiian Airlines. Kaula. So yeah, Auntie, you're the best if you're watching this. Um, but yeah, um, how was it that that time, Uncle John? If if you've had the pleasure of working with and or being a student of Uncle Johnny then anybody can agree with me when I say it's a labor of love um, being a, being in Uncle Johnny. Why I say labor of love is because when, you, when you're in Kaua Kanilehua, it's, it's not your conventional halal. We're very unconventional. Uh, if, if you had ideas of learning, uh, how to make lays and how this journey of hula and 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 make and you know like how a lot of Oahu halal do it, um, it's so not that. Uncle Johnny is a hakumele, a composer of music, and in turn that goes into his hula. So we only ever learn these. Um, dreams and manifestations of Uncle Johnny that are then haku into mele and then we dance the songs. And so that's what set us apart from the world is that we only do Johnny Lumho stuff. We don't, no more exception. We don't do anything else. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of saddening in the old days because when we would go and do uh, luau and or perform at a ho'olale or something, whenever we go do performances and we see other halal, you know, somebody plays kaulu kai or hula omaki and all the halal go up to dance except for us <laughs> because we don't know the song. Yeah, because Uncle Johnny no teach us that. Cause we were like we felt like the losers before, <laughs> because we don't we because we couldn't go and dance. But we never realized back then what we have come to know now is that it set us apart. 
we are we different. We don't we only do all this other stuff. And and the cool thing too is that Uncle Johnny's music isn't your everyday Hawaiian music. It takes a skill, a set skill set to be able to do what Uncle Johnny had written. And uh, you know, up until the last year and a half, there were only a few of us that could do Uncle Johnny's stuff. And in this uh, last year, our life hasn't been so forgiving. And so we've lost a big handful of those musicians. And so today there's only two of us left, three of us actually. Mm. So when we lost Darren, a um, few months before Darren, uh, there was Bert Naihe. Uh, that was a humongous blow to um, to that style of Uncle mm -hmm. Johnny and the music. And then several months later, Darren. Mm -hmm. And it went, we were like, oh my gosh, I cannot take it anymore. Yeah, you know. And so it's been, it's been rough uh, for all the Hula siblings with these passings. But um, if I could get back to being a part of Kauwu Kanelehua, between learning from Uncle Johnny, music and or hula, pick and you pick and choose. I think back on it now and there's so much stories to tell. And every time I think about it, it makes me smile. You know, Uncle Johnny, when he used to write his music, it always came the visions what we always what he would always call um, his inspirations. He, I had one vision. <laughs> uh, always came shortly after two thirty p.m. when the bar closed. <laughs> and so, about three thirty, three almost four o'clock in the morning, my house phone would ring. I was a young young teenager. He would call my grandmother. My grandmother would wake me up, go, hey. I wake up and I look at my grandmother, he goes, Uncle Johnny calling you. And I said, fight. I said, cover my wife. And I'm not like, go. Yeah, it's four, four o'clock in the morning. He said, tell you. Uncle Johnny said, you got to come down now. So my grandmother wake me up, jump in the car. We go down to the halal. And then Uncle John is over there. He had bought me breakfast from McDonald's. And then I sit down with him. And then whatever he went right, 2.30, between 2.30 and 4 o'clock, he teaching them to me before he go sleep because when he go sleep he will forget. And you know back then no more smartphones, smart device, anything for a recorder. So you got to write. But I was good at pa mele. Mm -hmm. So he sing it to me once pa. And so he, we did that for years, you know. And and I missed that. And the fact that I was able to have been that person, even though I was drunk, but <laughs> you know we did it for so long. And I would learn these mele, and it comes the following day, I got to remind him how the song go. And then we would do shows, and then I would have to sing, 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 jump off the stage, dance. And the song we dance is like 90 miles per hour, doing back bends off to the sides, dancing like one cow, dancing like one sheep, who knows, whatever he, that he wrote about. We got to embody that. And then as soon as that pow, Run back up on the stage, no can change, no can dab myself down, go into the next song, sing, 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 and then jump back up the stage again and dance again. I was skinny and young. I <laughs> could do it back then. You know, Uncle Johnny songs is in the heavens when you sing. It's high, 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 high. I cannot do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But I sure do miss it, though. Sounds like a really fun time in life, even though you had to get up really early. But yeah. The closest thing I can relate to that is just organized sports. <laughs> but my coach never called me at 4 o'clock in the morning <laughs> to do any training or whatever. So I got lucky on that. Oh, yeah. Uncle John used to call me early in the morning. <laughs> and even with Kaula, when we used to, when we used to do um, shows at Japan or mainland, we used to travel far. Um, every so often, Kaula came on our trips. Oh, she's a gas. <laughs> she's so awesome. We love her. We're so happy to be part of their Ohana. All right. Uh, 
I know you, you've you been traveling and singing uh, a lot recently, but do you think you're up to singing us a song on you the know? podcast? And you can totally feel okay to say no, because I usually offer it to my music mu- musical guests. But I, I know, like, just talking to you yesterday, your voice sounded Yeah, yesterday like, was a lost. great day to sing. Yeah. But um, I don't know what kind of voice I have today. Yeah, try. You can try them out. Yeah, we see. Okay, let's set it up and then we'll come right back. Okay, so for those who are still listening to this point, you're about to be blessed. And I am so honored to be able to sit with this guy right over here and listen to a song by Kwana Torres Kaile. So I don't know if you want to just go into it or you want to explain what you're going to sing. Or hey, just... oi. No. Up to you. Koi. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can balao after. Okay. <clears throat> That was so good. I can I can imagine how your voice can just get so sore singing like that. Like I feel like my my throat was getting sore just listening to you sing <laughs> that high. <laughs> um, you know, earlier we was talking about how uh, the voice box is a muscle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you can imagine singing, when you sing, the higher you go, the more force, the more air, the more muscle you use. You got the the voice box contracts and shifts and moves uh, according to what you're vocally doing, and so that's comparable to if you if you're doing curls mm-hmm. and you got to hold them and not move, mm-hmm. and then your voice moves and you move in a different way and you just got to hold them. So that pressure and um, that constraint when you hold it, that's the same thing with falsetto and, and falsetto and hai. In in Hawaiian music, especially especially leo kie kie, get two sides of leo kie kie, leo kie kie and leo hai hai. Leo kie kie is just uh, falsetto without the use of hai. 
leo ha'i ha'i is falsetto with the use of ha'i. And you, you, you some, to learn ha'i style, you got to be born with it. Not a, it, it cannot be taught. Um, some people can, some other people cannot. That's how come it gets two styles. Mm-hmm. But to utilize the ha'i style is an added muscle, so to speak. Because to do a ha'i, the ha'i, it's, it's in the word. It, um, it's a clean break in the voice. You're going from one note, which is in your chest, um, to another note, which is in the falsetto. And the ability to go back and forth with this ha'i and land on the correct notes takes a skill and you have to have good muscle control mm-hmm. for that. And so it's hard to do. And the older you get, the harder it gets. <laughs> <laughs> Is that almost like the, that yodeling? The, the... Same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Even when it comes to chanting, when people got, they got the... Well, that's, that's <laughs> ee, yeah. Oh, okay. That's the ee your, your e of your vibrato. Oh, okay. So it's yeah. different. Different. Okay. Yeah, so when you... The ee is just the ability to... The, the, your tanso, eh? Mm-hmm. In the back. That's a muscle too. You can... You can speed up your ee, or you can slow down. So you can do, uh, or uh, make them slow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but ha'i, ha'i is just break clean breaks between um, your chest voice and your falsetto. So like you, you like you said, <clears throat> um, there are certain songs that reflect uh, that yodel style. Mm-hmm. So there's a, like a, a famous song called. Uh, Nakapuel, which um, utilizes that ha'i. Nakapuel So that's that ha'i. <laughs> that ha'i style. So that that's a perfect example. And then you know you get that Texas yodo and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's ha'i in okay. a nutshell. Super cool. Thank you for sharing that and thank you for playing that music. What song did you sing? What, what's the Oh, the song I sang earlier. Uh, that one is a song I wrote uh, called Rain to Ahine. Mm-hmm. And during the pandemic, when everything shut down, you know, at first we said, yeah, I get one long vacation. And then after you passed, exceeded the vacation, you started to go crazy and never have nothing to do because we couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. And, I, and for me, the kicker was I couldn't go home. And in all that I do, no matter where I go in the world, going home back to Hawaii Island, that's, I need that. It grounds me because whatever drives me nuts, drives me crazy, um, whenever I go back home, I'm able to put my, my feet back in the dirt and all that goes away. Uh, and not being able to do that in 2020, literally drove me crazy. And so I remember one day I was feeling pretty down uh, and it started to rain heavily in Manoa. And the cunny of the rain just sang to me. Because, you know, come from Hilo, Mm -hmm. we love rain. We can think of 30 things to do in the rain and only four <laughs> things to do in the sun. <laughs> and so, so true. <laughs> and so when it started to rain, it, the, the rain pulled me out of a dark place. And so whatever was happening at that very moment, I picked up my pen and just started writing. And, started, so the, and it's very, the, the mele is very conversational. So you listen to the words, He nani ke lohe ike kani, pole na he ike pepe yao, ka rein tu ahine no ia, o ye ka vaiola manoa. And then as the day progressed, as I would look out my window and I see how the rain, as it fell and how it was making all the flowers in the plumeria tree fall down. So then I, then I wrote manoa no ho it na. Pua melia o mano kalani hale o yaka ino aku hale ne e hula ike ahe makani helele i iho ika ahe. Oh, so beautiful. So a very conversational, and there's something to be said. And poetic. There's something um, to be said about conversational type melody because it's melody then that we can not only understand but relate to in our mm. everyday life. So we don't always have to use kauna and that same. Ano of haku, kahakuana, 
like a poem or more. Mm-hmm. Um, although it's very pretty and it's another skill to be able to write like that. But at the end of the day, only you understand them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what what really are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to make your the people in your circle happy? Or are you trying to perpetuate something mm-hmm. for the for the, the, the Lahui, yeah? yeah. The boy Hawaii. So my older compositions, I used to write mele in that format. Why I used to use levels and layers of cow and I'm like, yeah. They'll never get this one. <laughs> and it's, I was right. Nobody got it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, every time I got to go explain them, I was like, I got to stop doing this. And so now I only ever utilize kauna. If I had haku somebody as like a makana for somebody, mm-hmm. and it's just for you, and then I use the kauna mm-hmm. or something that I want to pay, and then I put kauna. Other than that. Straightforward. I, yeah, I, I try, well, poetically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and so uh, that song I sang, Rain to Ahine, is a testament to that. That's awesome. It is It is weird how comforting the rain can be. It just rained a couple of days ago uh, outside of my house. And it was just so nice because I'm just by myself. I'm yeah. listening. It, it's calming. Uh, well, you're from Hilo too. You know it's like. Yeah. And at times we, we complain. Yeah, like, oh, can't go out and do this. It's raining or... But, you know, when you're away from it for so long, oh, you miss it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the land misses it. You can tell it gets all dry. Oh, just especially right now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I've always been, you know, I because I live and, well, come from, rather, Pi'ihonua, it's up in the mountain. So we all, it's always raining over there. You know, mm-hmm. if you're in Hilo, you're down by like Hilo Air, Airport, by the Aloha gas station, and you look up, towards the mountain. Everything's sunny except for up there. Every, up there, always <laughs> yeah, black. Yeah. And that's where Pi'i Honua is. Mm-hmm. So we're always dark over there. We're always raining over there. So we, the people of Pi'i Honua, we ma. Mm-hmm. That. And we, we've grown to love and have formed a relationship with that kind of a weather pattern. And so anytime I go someplace, even mainland, and I see dark clouds rolling and rain, I, hey, I always, I always smile. Mm-hmm. Because for me, that is a welcoming. Mm-hmm. The if blessing. I go someplace yeah. and hey, who want me? Right, Love that. Super cool. Mahalo for sharing that again. Yeah. I like to ask all of my guests when we get to the back end of the podcast about the word aloha and what keeping it aloha means to them because that's the name of the show. That's something I try to exude every day of my life. So to you in your life, how do you keep it aloha? That's a hard question, come on, God. I got the second half of the podcast is all the hard questions, so we're just getting started. You know, Hawaiian, it's hard to articulate a word Hawaiian into English because we can say a word or just a f- few short words and it sums up everything. Mm-hmm. But to articulate it into English is difficult because to me, aloha is not so much something that is put into words, it's an action. It's something that is lived and done, something that we do. And I think if I had to put it into words, then I'm going to use the ones that came before me as an example. You know, my mama, the one who raised me, um, it didn't matter to her who you are, where you came from, what your blood was. She didn't even have to know you. But if you needed help, she would help you. She would bring you into her house. She would feed you. She would put clothes on your back. And she would love you too. Now, if that's not aloha, I don't know what else is. That's unconditional. Love that. It doesn't matter your creed. That um, It doesn't matter how much you give. It's what you give. <laughs> That's Amazing. aloha. I love that. I I always like to think of aloha as, as unconditional. I believe it should be reciprocated. It doesn't have to be because you can give without expecting anything in return. It should be. But it, we cannot tell people exactly. you should be doing this. Because yeah. it, it, if you don't know already, then you then it's not happening for you. Yeah. 
But it, um, that, to me, that's aloha, unconditional aloha love. It comes from here. It comes from within. You don't do it because you need more followers on a post. You don't do it because so-and-so did it. You do it because your heart told you to do it. Mm-hmm. That is unconditional. Yeah. And I, I think that's what makes this place special, Hawaii special, the people special, especially seeing everything going on on Maui. So much unconditional love. So many people just giving their time, money, giving their hands to Kokua. Uh, it's amazing to see the aloha being shared with the world and the world seeing it shared. Like I, I worldwide, had, national news, everybody's seen it. Yeah, I, I had spoke with some of my peers some of my, and some of my close friends about uh, the Maui thing. And um, even some of my own family members. And I had scolded a few because um, I'm kind of a more of a straight up put your money where your mouth is kind of guy. Uh, and I don't like when people post, 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 post in terms of acting like they're doing something. Virtue signaling. Yeah. Is that what it's called? So I, used, I was telling my friend guys and my peers, I say, hey, just go and give money. Just go down the kind, just go somewhere and give them a thousand. Go buy one generator. Just go do something. Never mind go on your, your social media and go, oh, blah, 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 blah. You post and then you're the kind or share. Sharing helps. Mm-hmm. But we get a million and one people sharing already. Go do something. You like mm-hmm. help, go do something. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. post, you, hey, I bought a generator here. You don't need to be a part <laughs> yeah. of the million and one uh, fundraisers that they're having. You go mm-hmm. because you want to. Go someplace and you go and you give money and yeah. donate. I I love that. I love that perspective because that's something that I struggle with having a platform like this. Is I'm really against virtue signaling which is just like doing something to make yourself look better because a social cause is going yeah. on and, you know, you got to kind of follow suit. So it took, in the beginning, I really had to think about, be intentional of what I was sharing with Keep It Aloha on my own because I didn't want to share just to share. I see everybody making a video commenting on the the Maui fires and I was like, oh, do I have to make one now? Because everybody's yeah. expecting me. Because like, if I don't, then they're going to be like, why aren't you making one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I let it m- marinate for a little bit. This, this shared the important stuff, like um, where to donate and blah, blah, blah. Like those stuff I, I think are important. But not not so much like, oh, I donated to this. You should donate to or yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm the same with that. But I, I also believe in, I don't like, to me, in, in everything in life, I like to just, I give my time and give my my hana instead of just money. But I mean, so like we have shirts like this that we made. We collaborated with artists to to oh, raise nice. raise money for the people on Maui. You can go to mahaloshoots.com and buy some. This is with Jack Soren, our past podcast guest. So like doing stuff like that and, um, you know, if, if possible, help out where, where you can. But I, I was, I've been telling people when I made a video is just do what you can within your capacity. You know, That's you, don't, right. you don't have to do something and overextend yourself just to show people that you're a good person. If you're a good person, it'll show, you know. So for me, I feel like my kuleana was to use this platform to elevate, amplify the voices that need to be heard. And then to do what I can with, I'm part of a merch company. So that's what we can do. We can make merch, we can raise money, and we can kokua. Yeah, everybody help in their own different ways. Yeah. But the, the, you know, kind of like what you asked, what is aloha? I think this is a perfect example to exude that. What is, what is aloha? Yeah. Make sure you kokua. If you're going to kokua and kakoa, come from the right place with the great, with the right intentions. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, like some of my, um, some of my peers who you get, there's so much um, fundraisers happening, um, some of which are happening all at the same time. So it's, it's not really planned well. 
but a lot of my peers are just going and singing at these things. They just go and sing, just for sing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I go help. I go sing. But you're not really helping. Yeah, you gotta help help them. Mm-hmm. You know, my sister-in-law. Um, she when I was in the mainland, one of the first times you would contact me, uh, she had messaged me and told me that she was hurt. Her husband and some of her friends. Husband's friends, they all get boats. So they were the, one of the first ones to go to Kahana Bay, Maui, and go um, boat in uh, provisions and whatever, whatever needed. And I gave her a few thousand. I said, here, sister, whatever. Whatever you go buy with this, to go buy. And so they went. And to me, it's so good to know that I can help in just a small way. I don't know who going to. But at least I know going straight to them. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't get filtered in any way. And I was lucky in that way, in that regard, that my sister folks was able to take on to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can do anything else to help, I'm there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to go over there and see them. But I know, you know, I'm not a, I don't watch TV. Whatever I hear is on my Apple News mm-hmm. <laughs> or whoever tell me, whatever. Yeah. But um, I know it's, they're nowhere near out of the dark and they need cocoa. And so um, on my Facebook platform, I have a ton of followers on that one. And so I've been using my platform to um, get the, the names and the families of the people who do need help. I put the I, and I post all of their stuff, their Venmo and whatnot, um, and give everyone a chance to help in their own way if they can. Yeah. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of people do stuff like that, and it's so selfless. And even the people I see, like that guy, I don't know what the guy's name is, but it's Zaniac on on Instagram, and the guy Blake, I think. I see their videos, and I see them all. They're leading the charge and helping stuff, and I'm thinking. They probably got real jobs and stuff they got to do, but they're taking out their time, probably losing money to help out their ohana on Maui. Yeah. So I just think, I see it as so selfless. Like, I mean, I, I for me, I feel like I have no That's kuleana to, to be there. Nobody's asking me to help. Right there for you is aloha. Yeah. That's but, aloha. Yeah, it's, it's so cool to, to see it, even though it's such a devastating period of our history. There, the silver lining is, if there is a silver lining, is the aloha being shown. Yeah. The lokahi, yeah? Oh, yeah. Lokahi, just onipa'a, all those The fact that everybody words. came together. Yeah. To help. It makes me stories. proud. It makes me proud, honestly, to be from Hawaii and be it part does, of this community. Because, and it goes back to pride because mm-hmm. giving one a sense of pride to be from here, mm-hmm. to be Hawaiian. To see that amongst our people, tell me where else in the world. Name one for me and yeah. go. Yeah. See? How are you, Valeno? Hi. Oh, yeah. All right. So, growing up, did you ever struggle with trying to find your place in the Hawaiian culture? Or were you, were you always just confident in who you are as a Hawaiian? I wasn't confident at all, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think. So to speak, I just kind of stayed in, stayed in my own lane. Um, growing up in culture, growing up in doing music, in doing what I was doing. Coming from Hilo, you know, back then, we never really have people around in Hilo to, well, an abundance of them, rather, to be able to go and learn and do stuff. When I grew up in Hilo, before I was with Uncle Johnny, I used to, um, I learned from the Kalimas. Not to be confused with confused with Ivalani Kalima and um, that Kalima, the Hilo Kalimas. There was two other Kalimas that was living in Kyoka that came from here, Oahu, who, who, who were a musical family, Alberta and Alvin Kalima. And I learned music from them and I learned a lot from them. And then I fell into the... the um, Uncle Johnny and Halau Kua mm. Kanelehu. And those two were huge, huge uh, things that helped 
me grow in me Hawaii and music, music especially. It wasn't until I moved to Oahu that things, uh, then I really had to kind of fend for myself, figure things out, took, took it as they came. And so it was, it, it took some time to be able to do or get where I'm at today. Because sometimes when you don't have someone helping you or to tell you what to do at the very least, you got to literally work from the bottom up. Because eh? you go through life, you go through the to the whole thing and you do the, the wrong things and then you do the right things because you learn from the, your mistakes. Uh, one thing that I am thankful of is, you know, when, when we had our group and we started to do stuff around here in Oahu, um, I was the baby in the group. Mm. So everybody likes the baby in the group. And so a lot of, uh, when we would play music, different places, a lot of uh, who's who in music and who's who in hula would come and talk and offer help and offer ike about certain things. Mm. A lot of what I do, aside from what I what I gained from Hawaii Island and from my family and from Uncle Johnny and the, and the Kalimas and whatnot, here on Oahu, a lot of what I know came from those kinds of people. Yeah. Auntie Edith McKenzie, Auntie Malia Kreva, um, Auntie Momi, Momi Kepolino. So much, get plenty, come mm-hmm. on, so much. And it had not been for them and their efforts to just impart simplistic manao unto me. Probably wouldn't have pushed me into what I do today, well, all the other stuff that I do. It's because of all them put together. Yeah, and that gave you the confidence to... Yeah, but you see, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm very lucky in that regard because... I'm old enough to come from a time where those people were still available. Um, the, the generation today missed that boat. And so you can only hello. You only can look them up online. You can only read about it. You'll never... One of the biggest things about Mea Hawaii is mana. A transference of mana. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're doing lehulu, if you're doing... Um, wood carving, wood making implements, mele, haku mele. It doesn't matter what faction of um, Hawaii you do. The transference of mana is the biggest, the utmost important thing in all that we do. When you go and you learn kumu from your kumu hula, there's a transference of mana. Not only the imparting of ike, but the transferring of mana. Because you was there, and I will teach you this this certain way, you will also learn the ano of kela hana anaya. That's the mana. Mm-hmm. How kumu did them and why kumu did them. That kind of stuff you know can read about. You got to be there to be able to get that mana. In all that we do, that's why today we look at certain kumu olelo, or kumu lei hulu, or kumu lei, or kumu hula. Why is it, why are they so damn good at what they do? Because they were they had first hand experience with the people they were learned from. I'm not saying I'm good at all. I'm saying that I'm lucky in the regard that I got to learn from the people mm-hmm. yeah. that factor into my life and what I do. Makahana ka ike. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, and that that's the best. And I I. That's one thing that kind of bums me out about our generation is that we're we're not putting enough time in to learn from these people because n- maybe there isn't an abundance of resources like you Before. had back then. Um, but there are people who are leaders, who are um, knowledgeable, kupunas. They're, yeah. they're, they're still around. Even yeah. like think about just your own grandparents. How much time do you actually spend with your own grandparents learning your mo'okuo how? Uh, and asking them, like, what was it like for them growing up? Um, if they had any experience with Hawaiian language, um, or anything, and, like, yeah, anything like that. And I don't, I don't even put enough effort into. I only got one. Um, my grandmother is still alive. She she just turned eighty eight, but you know she's 
slowly declining. And I'm always telling myself, like, oh, I got to ask her more questions, learn more about my Portuguese heritage and all that. Because my brother always tells me about the stuff that he learned. And, you know, it's like, I'm busy. I got to do these other things. But it's something that I'm saying out loud so I can hold myself accountable. You know, I scold my siblings. I scold all my siblings because I'm the one who learned everything from my grandma. Everything. So I'm the one that everybody comes to now today. Oh, how mom did this? Or oh, how mama said this? How is it? Who is that? So, so, who, how are we related to so and so? Can you help me make this? Blah, blah, blah. And I, every time I get mad, I go, if you freaking would pay attention, when Mark came over and blah, 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 and they always wrote it, I go, don't worry, I. Mm-hmm. You could have learned all this. The choice is with you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you work. It doesn't matter if you busy. Because if you can make time for yourself, you can make time for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just maybe don't go on Instagram or TikTok or whatever as much. Because I tell you what can happen. They're going to holler. And then you're going to tell, you're going to live your life with regret. You're going to tell yourself, I should have this, I should have mm-hmm. that. I could have this, I could have that, but too late. Power it. Ohala e kapu ulena. Yeah, power it. Mm-hmm. I. I never got that chance to be that busy to the extent of saying, I don't have time for this. I, don't have... I was chosen already when I was young. So I was with mama already. And I was ma'a to doing all what mama do. Mm-hmm. So I was ma'a to doing kupuna kind of stuff. Um, and for me, it was fun. Because like I said, you're coming, you come from that time period. All that kind of stuff was fun for a kid. And with that, I I also got to meet all the family and, you know, all the ohana from Ka'u and all the ohana from Hamakua and YPO and all the ohana from Waimea Kohala. And that kind of stuff you pick, I, you learn too. I can run one emu by myself. I can tell you how we used to do them the old way, minus burlap bag and minus tarp. I can tell you how we do it today. I can tell you how to go hunt for, for pua. Where for go, what for look for, what kind of whole I learn for look for. All that kind of stuff I learned. I don't do it anymore. I'll probably get a heart attack and forget asthma <laughs> attack if I tried. But I learned all that kind of stuff. You know, my grandmother used to tell me um, all kind of stories, mo'olelo, about growing up in Pio Noa and growing up in White Pio and the kupua of this area and the kupua of that area. And how when she used to go with her father, um, they had to make ho'okupu for certain things and certain places you got to put the, the honeybee, um, the beeswax in your ear, you got to put burlap on your head. I used to tell my grandmother, I go, how come? She said, because when you go to this kind of place, they let you go, but you can't can look them. So you put the bag on the head. I go, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting kind of mo'olelo. Oh, kind, so I know plenty kind. That's all my grandmother used to tell me all the time, different stories. You know, over here, you see that pond over there? Underneath, get one cave, that thing, all the way to the kai, the po'e, hi'u'i'a. I go, what is that, my hi'u'i'a? It's the mermaid. Yeah, they come, they come over here, because they, they come inside, because over here, get all the, get all the hua, the hua mai'a. They like eat. So they come over here, but when the kanaka come, they hear many, and they come inside, and they put him in the water. So you come, you put over here, you put the, you put the honeybee, she called them the honeybee, but mm-hmm. beeswax. <laughs> put the honeybee in your ear. And then they put the burlap. And so I go, so how you know where you're going? She goes, the donkey. The donkey know where for go already. So we sit on the donkey and we, we just go. Hmm. Do you do you believe all the folklore? Oh, yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, some is kind of a little far-fetched, but um, I had my own experiences with certain things. Night marchers. Uh, not, so, not so much um, Poi Helipo, but... Um, Because God forbid if I ever see that kind of stuff. But (laughs) I have my own um, run-ins with kupua. If you've seen one kupua, that's enough. Mm -hmm. You don't need to see any more. Yeah. But um, not to be confused with kepalo or uhane or just ghosts. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Like kupua. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian kupua. 
cool. Get to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Kamaka get. Especially our island. Hawaii yeah. island. Oh, I remember. Oh, we, we we camped in the sixth grade at Ke- Ke'e, I think it was called. Mm-mm. I think it was on Kona. the Kona side. Ke'e. And then uh, as you're, when you're a kid, I don't know, your your friends is kind of like make trouble. Yeah. But I don't, I swear one time they were talking about the night marches or we like would hear stuff and they said, you know, if you see the night marches, you got to take off your clothes and like. Stay still. Yeah, they say all kinds of stuff. They, they say, say all kinds of stuff. Yeah. They, say, they tell you, you God, God hope you get on Ohana inside there because if they get, if you get then they don't bother you. Yeah. But I never had a run in with them, mm-hmm. like seeing them or anything. But I have heard it because mm-hmm. in Pihonua we get two trails that I know of that I was made aware of, and in Pihonua back then, quieter, you can hear a pin drop, up, up Pihonua. We could hear the drums. Late at night, two o'clock in the morning. You sure that was in Jordan? No, it was in Jordan. It's an interesting thing because it sounds like pahu. Yeah, yeah. It's not like like a drum set like we're thinking of music. It's more like... Boom, boom, like yeah. yeah. It's a trip. Yeah. So I've, on one occasion, actually several occasions in Pi'ohonua where I come from, I've heard the drumming. Um, and then my grandmother heard them too. She, she told me, get it. Jack, get in your yeah. room, go sleep. And she shut the door. She put salt around the house. And then um, the other time, we saw a llama up in the forest coming down. Like a line of llama. Mm-hmm. So I told my grandmother one time, Ma, what is that? She go, what you looking at? I go, where did she go? Get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and we went home. <laughs> Oh, interesting. But that was that was the night marches. But the the kupua kind of stuff. I've saw, I've seen this certain kind of kupua three times already in different parts of Hawaii Island. I saw them once in Kohala, um, in Pololu. I saw them another time in um Laikavai, Hilo. And then I saw them another time in uh the Kilauea Flats, as you're going towards Kau, after you pass the Mauna Loa, Mauna Loa Road. But there's a certain kupua who has real frizzy, frizzy, frizzy orange hair, bright, 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 big yellow eyes, and get this kind of teeth. Mm-hmm. Big, big face, and the smile go literally from ear to ear. Mm-hmm. I've seen them three times in wow. those three places. And uh, just for people who don't know what that means, I'm, I know you're probably thinking it's kind of like if you think of a, um, it's not like a, a ghost, it's like a mo- like a monster kind yeah, of like demigod like, kind. Demigod, like if you think of some so, something in mythology, I'm thinking of something from Alice in Wonderland. Like that, yeah. that's kind of what I think when I think of a kupua. That kind. Yeah. So you know, in my family, on my on my on my mom's the yeah, yeah. On, on my mom's side. Uh, we had both kahuna la'au lapa'au and kahuna ana'ana. And my dad's side was all kahuna ana'ana. And up to my, on my dad's side, my, my great-grandmother's passing, up until her death, she was 14th or 16th generation kahuna ana'ana, an unbroken chain. Wow. And they, were, they, they used to call her, um, and every all the kupuna in Papaiko knew of her. They used to call her Tutu Papaiko. And any kupuna you say, oh, you remember Tutu Papaiko? How do you know that name? Yeah, because she was feared in Papaiko because she was like on one kahuna you know mess around with. And that was my great my grandma. <laughs> um, you get good mana in your family then. Shucks, I never get nothing out of them. <laughs> the musical stuff, but um, no. So as a result. Because we come from a family of that kind of stuff. Oh, all okay, kinds stories. We know some some of them are um, encounters, firsthand experience, and then all the kupua kind of stuff. So on my dad's side, my my dad's grandfather, um, and all his siblings, they had mana kamaka, they had ungodly strength, and um, their father could speak to Aumakua. Mm. And so my dad's grandfather, which is my great-grandfather, used to tell my dad nightly at their home, Aumakua come to the house asking their father 
for help to help them. Um, and, and I used to ask my father, what do you have to help them with? My dad didn't know. And then later on, I met one of my, uh, my grand aunts and they told me, she said, oh, because Tutu Papa um, was the only one that could talk to them and he would help them go to the next place. Mm. I don't know what that means. Yeah. But she said, oh, yeah. So um, there's, you know, um, when they used to do all those Mauna Lea in- interviews, not the one that um, Larry Kimura did, the one with, um, they had the Polo Colombo. And it's like you can find on YouTube, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember so there was one and her name is, um, her name is Helen Averro. She, she, she was living here, but her maiden name is Awa'a. She's from um, Kauai Hayuka Waimea, Big Island. It's my grandfather's sister that they interviewed her like several times. And, you know, usually in those kind of interviews, they, they talk to the kupuna and they say, oh, you have any mo'olelo you can share with us from your whatever. And so she would tell them, oh, yeah, my father, blah, blah. And she tell them the story. They don't know what for say after. But they're all, all in shock. And get the one out of tutu that always helped them with the Bolokolamu. And she always, she's very... Christian, eh? but my, my grand aunt's are telling about all the kind of opposite Christian stuff. Mm-hmm. She like, don't know if I'll say, but she was, she was, even on that interview, she tells, oh yeah, oh, the kupu will come our house, oh, the omokua. She said, the enu he kam, the iole nu he kam. So, oh, this, so I used to tell my auntie Helen, I go, auntie Helen, kela, kela, kela iole nu he haka inu, kela, kela iole, ah, uh, ah, uh, she said, she told me the own name. She said, I loa ke kahi, uh, inua ke la iole, a hi ole nui, uh, ho kumu ke a iole nui, ho kuma ko halem, i, i, kawai huka, kawai huka, kawai hai uka nei, kumu ke a iole nui, kuma ko, ah, maka u mako. Cause he, I said, ki e ki e ke a iole, ah, ki e ki e no. So just like leaking me out, I go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. She said, I think taught. Talking taut, about a big like, rat. <laughs> yeah. But like as tall as us. Yeah, big, you oh. only. She said, but her brother had mana like her father, who talked to, to Amakua. And they was living in Kauai Hayuka at the time. And her their school was on just um, below the road, the old road for Waikiki. He used to have one school the old Waikiki road. And so from Kauai Hayuka to there, it's Mamao. So they had to take the horse and they would leave the house at about uh, one, one, in a cl- one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and start making their way. So by the time school starts, they just arrive. And so she said she was young because she was two years younger than her brother. So he would tie her on top the up to the saddle, and she said, just kind of never <laughs> level all over the, the house. And then she remember when they would, um, when they start traveling, her brother used to chant, Iole Manaku is the name of the rat. Mm-hmm. She said, she said, oh yeah, when we, when I go, Mako Mako Hu Kaiana, uh, Loewao Ko Kaoliana Ko Uplala. Oh yeah, oi, Iole Manaku Ku Uhoao Kiao Moe. Mm. Kind of like inviting them, like yeah. not, not and showing and my auntie, my auntie tell me, she go, <laughs> but she's like, she's telling this story. She's like, oh, I thought my brother was only singing. But when, when you only came, he they only come yeah. and, and kahu them. That's so cool. All the way and, over so, there. and then so when this brother, this brother would get mai because mm-hmm. that va had, you know, get okay mai. Yeah. And so he had got influenza and he had make. And so when the, after we in Hala, she said her brother's body was in the, was in the kitchen after he make. Yeah, so this is in the early 1900s. They bury them themselves, eh? So she said, my mother was outside doing something. My father was outside. Stayed, stayed making um, for brother. And then I, all of a sudden, I walk in the kitchen. Yo, big rat inside. I think it's more big than me. She said, Moto. She yeah, ran outside. She yelled, Mama, Mama. Hey, Iole, Nui, Loko Kahale. Dang. You don't hear about stories like that these days. 
can plan stories like that in my family. Huh. Maybe it's a, yeah, it's a, it's from family to family. I don't have any stories like that in my family. That's so cool though. So my, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my grandmother, we raised with our families from Kohala, YPO, Ka'u. And so, you know, when, when Kupuna get together, they don't live all kind of old, more little old stories. So when I got a little bit older, my grandmother used to tell me all kinds of stories. And I used to ask questions. I go, Ma, you know when uh, uh, Uncle William guys used to come for Ka'u, what you guys used to do? She goes, ah, well, I don't want to know. Uh, what you guys talk about? She goes, ah, Poe Kau Hilea, Poe Kau Aihulama, Poe Kau Enuhe. I go, where's all that? She goes, oh, Hilea is Makai. I go, I go where's the, um, all the other people? She goes, oh, mountain. Ina ina oi mai kamau na mai and o mako mai kekahakai mai ah karana like lako ina make make oi ai io la me mai ka io mai kamau na mai ina make make ka ono ke kai ha we na ia mai ke kai mai ahi ki ka that's how the ahupua system started <laughs> right there because her father her father was um. He was a, not game warden, but forest ranger. Mm-hmm. And he would mal- he malamba certain uh, ranges in Ka'u. So he used to live Ka'u. And then that's how we get Ohana in Ka'u. Um, so she used to tell me all the stories about Ku Mauna and uh, Pu'u Enuhe and the Po'ehilea. And then she tell me all the stories about um her tutu folks in my in my PO. Oh, that's oh some, my that's God. some trippy story. My PO, that's the we we camped over there too one time or not camp, but we stayed there for school. Yeah, the son will come up to after oh. ten you. I that, that mana down there. I getting chickens. Can yeah, just think you think about it's scary. Just to let you guys know, for whoever listening, that's spiritual. Down if there. you ever find yourself in YPO after dark, don't go lingering, don't go wandering around. No, uh, th- that's honest to God truth. Oh. Don't don't mess around with that stuff. And yeah, YPO is that's the the valley of the mana. the kings, right? The chiefs. Yeah. Long time you so you know when you go to YPO and you look from the scenic point, uh, you look straight across mm-hmm. the donkey tra- the zigzag trail, yeah. Mm-hmm. The Waimanu trail. You can hike that one, yeah. Huh? Me. No, 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 but like you oh. in general, like you yeah, can Yeah, you hike can. That, yeah. yeah, not me personally. <laughs> that would be like my death. But <laughs> So at the very bottom of that trail, they call it Waimanu Trail. If you look from a certain um, angle up, um, on the scenic point, you can see one Hale right at the bottom. But that Hale stay behind against the wall of the valley. You know, one protrusion that comes out from the valley wall is on boulder, just big boulder. My grandmother told me a story. She said, a long time ago, on the beach, right where that um, the base of Waimanu Trail is. She said, you used to have on puka on the beach. I said, puka? She said, yeah, well, big anna mm-hmm. on the beach. I said, and she's, I told her, what is that? And she said, yeah, so the other side of that is Molokai. She said, she said, oh, the lapu, oh, the kepalo, they travel between Molokai. You ever heard of that? How no. This, so the, in the old days. Was that like a cave or something? No, there? it's one. Like on portal thing. Oh, portal. Oh. Yeah, they would open up on the on the mm. on the beach. Um, and it is it's it's not a it's not just white people. I've heard it in other places too, Olokai and Nanae and Kauai, but white people used to have too. And so this thing would open, and out come all these freaking things. And so at that point in time in white people's history, oh, white people had hard time with all this. Kepalo and these things running about and create havoc in white people. And so my grandmother told me that all this, all the elders would get together. They went into the back of white people Valley and they had Oli and they went chant. And they, they, this took so many days to do. So nonstop chanting from the back of the valley and they made their way down, down, down to the beach. And as they Oli, they push all the Kepalo out of the valley. And when they they had uh, 
trouble because that uh, portal thing that opened up on the beach went closed. And there was no place for go. One of my great grandfather's brothers, my Tutupaele, them they were tasked with making this cave. So at the very base of the Waimanu Trail where this protrusion thing I was telling you, um, that protrusion is a boulder. You remove that boulder, it's a cave. What they did was they enchant all this kepalo and stuff down to the bottom of Waipio into that cave and they went cap them. So if you go there today, if you ever go to the base of Waimanu and you walk about 30 yards to the left, you can see this thing coming out of the rock. put your ear on that rock. I scared. <laughs> <laughs> my, grand, my grandmother said, she go, yeah, my stupid brother. He no believe. He go over there. I, I go, what happened? She go, he put his face on top of the... Uh, he would go put his face on the rock. He come back and he get his teeth all pehu. All swollen in the front teeth. I go, how come his teeth... We told him, go, listen. Instead of putting his ear, he put his face. <laughs> hey, maybe he would have lost an ear though. Oh, who knows? Oh, that's wild. But yeah, he's, he's just told me, oh, pehu his face all over here. Dang, that's that's crazy. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, I better shut up because I can actually tell so much. Oh, I know. I, I'm, I'm thinking of like spin-off series of the podcast where I just have people tell stories like that. That's so interesting. You get plenty, my friend. Yeah. Family. Awesome. But we are coming to the end of the podcast. And uh, I just want to know, after all the things that you've done, you have so many accomplishments and, you know, you're still really active, doing a lot of things. What are you most proud of? That's a good question. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that I never planned on doing what I'm doing now. This was never in the cards for me, so to speak. But to be able, in retrospect, to be able to do what I'm doing now, if I sit back and look, that's a blessing for me. Um, I'm not saying that's a blessing to others. For me, it's a blessing because I'm, I'm, I've reached a point in my life where all the stuff Mama used to just tell me, but not teach me, just tell me about, or show me, or auntie and uncle would show me, or when I came to Uncle Johnny and, um, and the Kalimas, and they would show me, and I came to Oahu, and they showed me. It was never a classroom setting, sit down, learn. Take notes, how, no, yeah. Never. That was never, because that's not the Hawaiian way. That's not the Hawaiian philosophy of teaching. Mm-hmm. The Hawaiian philosophy of teaching is noho, pako waha, ho'olohe. Yeah, yeah. That is, monkey see, monkey do, mm-hmm. basically. I'm in a position now that everything that I've soaked in from all those before me, I'm now giving or it's being reciprocated. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's a blessing. And to be, to sit down and come to realize that what I'm doing now um, makes me smile. It makes others smile too. When I play music, I think one of my greatest joys is being on a stage because music for me is a, is a conduit for not only mele Hawaii, mo'olelo Hawaii, because that's what Mele is. It's somebody else's story. But it it, it gives me, a, it enables me to manifest my emotions in a different way. And for me and what I do, I need that. Um, it, it Because inside me, I have so, I, I'm not saying I'm emotionally unstable, but I get so much inside of me that I gotta, I need a release. And music is a release for me in that way. And it brings, it, it. when I'm on a stage, you can tell if you watch me sing, I'm someplace else. And every time uh, my band members, as soon as the song, Pao, I have Glenn on the side of me, the next song is this. 
telling me what's going on because they know I'm like, <laughs> Lord knows where Kuana is. Yeah, you're bringing with the me, Kufunas, bringing me back to speed, <laughs> up to speed. What's happening? What what's what song is next? So and so's dancing. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it is for me. Awesome, super cool. What what is the future for you and uh, uh, Nepal Palai? Um, well, I hope this is the hope. I can't, I can't really say what our future is, but I hope that we are able to still create music or at the very least sing with each other until no can. Mm -hmm. Um, I can say this without being or sounding a ho'oyo in any way. I know that when the three of us get together, there's something special. And I know there's nobody else can, that can do what we collectively can do. The fact that we're still alive and that we still can sing says to me, why not? Why, why wouldn't you guys still sing? And so I'm thankful that we actually have a show coming up. And uh, as I've jokingly said to some other people before, I say it takes about four or five years for us to like each other again so that we can go <laughs> on the stage and sing. But um, actually, we have a show coming up next weekend uh, in Hilo. Oh, nice. So that will be the kicker uh, for this year, and then we have several more coming up. Awesome. Well, I hope I can attend one of them Come. at some point. You should make time. Oh, actually, I'm going to be in Hilo next week for my niece's birthday. Well, I mean... This is going to be past when everybody's listening to this, but I, I'm going to be there for um, for my niece's uh, second birthday. When are you going now? Saturday. That's when the show is. Yeah. So maybe party in the daytime, party at night. Come. Okay. Yeah. Take, you have my message um, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll find out who you like bring with you from your yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. I'll come with Lei and um, we'll bring the Mo'opunas and stuff. Yeah. Oh, that'll be awesome. Yeah, come. Cool. Okay. We'll be at the palace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy. Okay, mahalo. What is something you wish people knew about you that they don't? You know, my my life is an open book. <laughs> I don't think there's anything people don't know about me. What do you think is something that they misunderstand, possibly? Um, I've been told that from afar, I look like a murderer. <laughs> what? Unapproachable, shall I say. I've never seen a murderer or someone unapproachable I with... Yeah, I don't know what a murderer looks like. But, um, <laughs> sure hope they don't look like me. Um, no, I've been told that I, I, I look unapproachable. I think... Um, <laughs> I don't know what that's all about. But if you guys ever see me and I look like an unapproachable kuana. Come talk to come talk to me because you'll find out that I'm quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people just are in the zone or thinking of something else. Yeah, or... sometimes and you know, the the look we have on our face is our thinking face yeah. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or if you wear glasses and you don't have your glasses, we're squinting. Squinting could be passed off it's, as exactly. I, I think angry about that face. all the time when I'm surfing, because I'm always smiling and like people always tell me I'm always happy. But sometimes when I'm surfing, I'm like because like the sun's in my eyes and I'm trying to see when the next wave's going to come. So I feel like sometimes I, I feel unapproachable. But I don't think so because people still talk to me. Yeah. So. I think that's all about the only other thing with me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So before we end the podcast and we get to our last questions, I got to know, what is your life hack? <sighs> Eat, sleep, repeat. <laughs> I don't really have a, you know, I, I travel so much in my life that at some point you develop a callus, so to speak, um, for doing that. And I don't necessarily have a hack for doing what I do. It's more a determination, not to my... Not so much to my craft, 
but to what I love to do. I think if you set your mind to something, not so much your goals and what you want, but set your mind to something that makes you happy. Because happiness, I think, is the best gasoline, so to speak, to keep you going, no matter what you do. You can be at a junk place doing something that you don't necessarily want to do. But if you can find or focus on something that brings you happiness, usually that kind of stuff has a tendency to push you where you need to be. Yeah, give you that extra push. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with what I do. Love and that. what I do makes me happy. Awesome. And it keeps me going. I, I love when I hear people say that. Super cool. All right. So here is our last Fast Faith 5 questions. These are just rapid fire answers, okay? Favorite flower? Lehua. Favorite travel snack? McDonald's. Uh, roasted, unroasted, salted, unsalted, salted, chocolate covered. S- salted and lightly salted or honey. Oh, the honey is good. Favorite way to de-stress? Go to the beach at Laie Kavai. Mm. I hope, uh, can you cut that part out? Because I don't want anybody to go over there. <laughs> it's going to be like uh, uh, dubbed over when you say it. <laughs> Fa- favorite way to de-stress? Go to the beach at Alawai Canal. <laughs> That's what going to sound like. <laughs> okay, favorite song to hula? My favorite song to hula is like asking a musician, what's your favorite song? I didn't want to ask that because I, I thought maybe the hula one would be easier. But I guess not. <laughs> it's not that. It, it changes. It okay. changes every time. So currently, one of my favorite songs to dance, even, and this might sound terrible because I wrote the song, but that song I sang earlier, Rain to Ahine. Oh, there's a hula to it? Yeah. Okay. Are we going to see it at the palace next week? I can't do two things at once. Hey, you can try. <laughs> I would, I would, that would be my last performance. He okay. was singing, he was dancing, and he fell over. Here, here lies Kuanda. <laughs> <laughs> Took advice from podcast hosts. Yeah. Come on, God. At least it would be there at the palace. Shucks. <laughs> hey, there's worse places to go out. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite place to get food in Hilo? Chang's oyster Chang. chicken fried rice. Right think, next to right next to Kadota's case drive-in. I think Kalani Pao might have said that too. No, no, he said a different one. It might have been Chang's though. But yeah, that that's next to Cage Drive In. Yeah, the, right below. Below by um So there's actually two of them. There's one um in Ling's, which is the one up by Kite Puanako. Okay. You know, okay. we're second saves there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right around the corner. Okay. And they're just... They're sisters. Oh, okay. So technically, they have the same menu. Yeah. Kind yeah. of, sort of. But um, for anybody wanting to go to Hilo, if you want a Chinese fix, they're the only ones that make oyster chicken the way they do. Boneless, hot, fried rice. So I recommend oyster chicken fried rice kaoyuk. Mm-hmm. I got to try that. I don't know if I've ever tried that from there. Next time you make on food, Holo Holo podcast, <laughs> please invite me. I will. We got to do a bunch of spin-off series after this episode. <laughs> all right. But that's all we have for today. I just want to say mahalo so much for coming and talking stories, sharing your manao, your mo'olelos. Uh, it, it was, it's it been such an, an honor. And I, I hope to re- go to the palace and see you perform live with the rest of your Mahalo. Bandmates. Are you coming to the palace? Yeah, I, I will if I'm there. If I don't have to be with my family later at night whenever the show is in. That's It'll like the there. following day from Saturday. That's Sunday. Oh, wait, it's on Sunday? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, Sunday. Oh, wait. So Saturday. Is that, is that when football starts though? I'm not too sure. Oh, I got to check my calendar. But I will try to make Try it. one of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but is there anything you want to share with the audience before we wrap up? No, I think I'm okay. Thank you so much for having me. Mahalo, Nui. And yeah. if you guys ever have questions no for me, just message me on social media. It's the easiest way. Yeah, yeah. Go do that. And where can we find you? Where can they find you on social media? Um, if you're on IG, Instagram, uh, Kahele Mele is my handle. Um, and if you're on Facebook, um, it's just my name, Kuanatoris Kahele. 
Awesome. Well, mahalo kuana for joining us on the Keep It Aloha podcast. Spread love, be kind to one another, and mahalo for listening to us today. We have new episodes every Thursday, so make sure you follow us and leave a review. I'm your host, Kamaka, and remember to always keep it aloha.